all the bright minds that have made India proud. In fact, uh, through the last three days of engagement, I've learned a lot. It's been a huge amount of new energy that I'm taking back from my visit to the Bay Area. Most of you working here have experienced India in the past, have now worked with uh, the Silicon Valley for many years. But I'm really delighted that almost all of you who I met have kept a little bit of India in you. There's still that connect with the motherland. There's still a great deal of affection for the country back home and its people. And for that, I'm really grateful to the leaders of the society here who have managed to keep this fire about India live and uh, who have put in that extra effort so that you, your children, continue to be proud of your country and continue to engage with India with a little bit of, uh, I would say, soft spot. And I could see that in all the engagements that we had over the last two days, or even this morning, that the Indian community here, while very innovative, very professional in their approach, has maintained the Indian culture, maintained Indian value systems. Most of you have maintained your family value systems, in a way keeping the soul of India alive and kicking in the Bay Area. We have, over the last eight years in government, been very conscious of the changing times worldwide. So in 2016, when the Prime Minister launched the Startup India Initiative, it was a recognition of the growing importance of innovation, the growing importance of young talent experimenting with new ideas, coming up with uh, solutions to day-to-day -day problems of life. And uh, sometimes when I think what, what really is a startup or what are you trying to do, I realize it's only recognizing where the problem is and finding a solution to that problem. Just to make life easier for businesses and for all of humanity. So maybe some innovator someday prepared this to get rid of the problems of uh, the wire and the long uh, uh, cabling all over the place whenever they had to record. Must have been just somebody who did that. I won't be surprised if uh, one of these days we'll actually see what, uh, what we saw in the movies in the old times uh, the automobiles coming right up to your 30th floor apartment and park there and you walk out into your home. Uh, which movie was that? I failed to remember, <laughs> but there was a movie around this. Because you're willing to experiment. You're willing to put your money uh, at risk, which is great and which is something Prime Minister Modi recognized in 2016. We are proud that we have a very vibrant uh, startup ecosystem in India today, which is also broadly looking at making life easier for the people of India, businesses in India. We do believe a lot of the ideas that are developed in India have the cozy comfort of a large market, domestic market and may not have engaged with the rest of the world as much as they should or could. So that's another area which, I, which came to my attention during the course of the last three days that we need to have more opportunities for our Indian startup ideas to be able to look at global markets. And I think there can be no better place than uh, Silicon Valley to go global in terms of our ideas. I'll come to that in a bit or in the course of our conversation. But uh, 
we recognize that innovation, R&D is going to lead the way going forward. We also recognize in government in India today that international engagement will have to expand. Of course, we can, we can uh, understand our own abilities, strengths, possibly weaknesses also, and engage based basis the real position. But we'll have to engage with the world, otherwise we'll be either left behind or we'll miss the bus. No country in the world has become a developed country without significantly expanding engagement with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And you might have noticed that over the last uh, couple of years, we've been focusing, for example, on exports in a big way. So last year, we did 675 billion of goods and service export, which is the highest ever. And uh, this year, we hope to cross 750 billion, considering it's our 75th year of independence. <laughs> it connects well. But by 2030, I imagine our international export of goods and services to be a trillion dollar each, collectively being two trillion dollars, which means we are looking at a 3x growth in eight years. Sounds a little out of the ordinary. It'll need uh, goods to grow at about uh, probably 10, 11% and services to grow at uh, possibly 13, 14% or 15%, mm -hmm. both of which are eminently doable. And government is now looking at uh, our international outreach very, very clinically, very professionally, engaging all the missions. So Dr. Prasad now has a KPI that he has to <laughs> perform on, which includes for ease of convenience, I'd say it'll be 10x of what it is today. So 30 billion, 30 trillion plus in the next 30 years. But that's a business as usual scenario. If we are a little more bold and aggressive, my sense is we could actually shoot for a anywhere between 35 to 45 trillion dollar economy. Maybe by 2047, if we really go very aggressively, and the kind of work or the foundational work that Prime Minister Modi has focused on in the first term, if it was not for COVID and then the subsequent Ukraine-Russia conflict, should have already got us onto that path. We lost a couple of years, unfortunately, in this whole process, but we, we are confident we'll make up for this lost time. But CII, for example, estimates Indian economy to be at anywhere between 35 and 45 trillion by 2047, when we celebrate 100 years of independence. And therefore, Prime Minister Modi calls this the Amrit Kal. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the defining period of India's journey towards becoming a developed nation, and India's journey to take prosperity to every single person residing in India. All of you have an important role to play in this journey because you recognize talent, you recognize new ideas, innovation, and very often you finance such uh, initiatives. We are on our part trying to marry the two, marry your offerings from offshore to India's capabilities and abilities onshore in India. We can only play a little bit of a facilitation role. It will ultimately have to be our Indian businesses which will have to go out and connect with you and take this dialogue to the next level. But we do get a lot of ideas from engagements such as this, which I'm hoping to also get in the course of our discussion. For example, very clearly, one takeaway that I take from here is that if we have to encourage more people to locate in India, startups and new ideas to locate in India, we'll have to do some consideration on a few policy matters. I've certainly taken back uh, good ideas about the four or five critical uh, 
elements of the startup ecosystem or the expectations from people in uh, the US or overall the investing community, which can help further speed up deployment of capital and encouraging new innovation in India. On our part, I can only say that we are trying to move away from the red tapeism which used to exist in the past. We're trying to look at every single opportunity to make business or conducting business easier in India, not just the EODB rankings, but literally on the ground, real life examples. You know, the other day, the prime minister actually guided me. Parliament was in session. I was talking to him in parliament. And he said, look, the best way to understand the pain points is that you talk to the people who actually fill out a form and who actually have to, on the front face, deal with government or deal with government processes. And now I have my teams doing that. So we've identified 75 different sectors, right from a small restaurant or a shopkeeper to a large factory, maybe a cement plant, a steel plant, or whatever, a furniture manufacturer, whatever. And I'm trying to get our teams at senior official level to talk to the people who actually run the entire government industry, government business interface to identify where we can make life easier for them. So our idea is that the old days of policy paralysis moved to a more proactive uh, engagement with all of you, bring in greater degree of policy certainty and predictability, see where regulatory processes also need to be more aligned with what's happening in the West or in developed economies. The old ways of working, the bureaucratic ways of working are giving way to technology and transparency in a big way, which I think is the best way to bring honesty into systems. I think a combination of uh, understanding where technology can play a role, uh, particularly with transparency thrown in, can transform the way government works in India. And that's the effort we are trying to do. You've seen some of that in our initiatives like UPI. It's government funded but privately led and turned out to be a grand success. I think the India stack would have will probably land up creating 40, 50 unicorns, if not more. Mm -hmm. And maybe some sunicorns also. Decathons, they are? Decathons. Decathons. Sorry. Decathons. Some decathons. <laughs> sunicorns are on the way. But yeah, some more decathons in the fintech space. Similarly, we are, again, in a public-private partnership mode, looking at the open network for digital commerce, which I personally am very committed to and I believe will transform e-commerce in a fashion that will help small mom and pop stores also survive and save jobs, save entrepreneurs in a big way. Something which I think the US lost out on. It's now very difficult to find a truly mom and pop store now, except maybe in some tourist places where you could have a small niche designer store or something. As a country, the 1.3 people, 1.3 billion people present a big, big market opportunity. Because that's an aspirational India today. What with the advent of internet across the country, we have mobiles powering knowledge and information to our people. We already have 2G across the country. 4G almost covers more than 90% of India. There are about 20,000 villages out of 600,000 villages. Cities and towns are all covered. It's these remote villages, some of them in terrorist area, infected areas or mountainous areas, where we have just now sanctioned two and a half billion dollars in the cabinet to set up uh, telecom towers and maintain them for five years. Uh, we are funding that from government so that the last 20,000 villages also get 4G connectivity. And on 1st of October, we are launching 5G in India. Well, I shouldn't be commenting on the country I'm sitting in, <laughs> but I 
do believe with my own experiences of the last three days that things haven't changed much in the telecom systems here over the last <laughs> few years. Sensing such advent of uh, technology through the country. Incidentally, we're also taking broadband through optic fiber across the length and breadth of the country. But on the one hand, technology, but on the other hand, we are also moving on welfare measures to get more and more people assured of a basic and decent level of uh, comfort, the basic needs being met, electricity, uh, gas connections, toilets, good homes, mm -hmm. internet connection, as I mentioned, roads up to the villages, right up to the villages, uh, high-speed highways to connect cities and towns, good airport infrastructure to provide connectivity across the country, upgrading our railway systems, our port systems, so that we can do much more, greater degree of trade. All of that is happening. But uh, we would love to hear from you what more we can do, what more we need to focus on. And you, in that sense, are our permanent ambassadors from India. What you can share with your experiences to us, for us to reorient our own policies and philosophies, and as ambassadors from India to the US, what you can convey to the uh, businesses here in terms of opportunity in India is a very important role you all play. You have a unique positioning as the connect between the two. And I must say we're grateful for all the good work that you're doing. And I do look forward to your continuing this effort and this engagement to bridge India and the United States businesses people-to-people -people contact. On a government-to-government -government level, I can tell you we've never been stronger allies or partners than we are now with the United States. So please uh, continue your achievements. We are very proud of that. And do continue to engage with India as much as you can in the years to come. Only thing I can say is that after having spent three days in San Francisco, I'm reminded of what Rudyard Kipling had once said, that San Francisco has only one drawback. It's very hard to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll let the minister